All righty. Welcome and welcome back to the 2021 Equal Pay and May Roundtable Series. Um, my name is Shay Tia Sproul. I am your moderator for today. I work with the Office of Economic Empowerment. And this series, as you may already know, is a collaboration between the Office of Economic Empowerment, the Massachusetts Commission on the Status of Women, and the Massachusetts Women of Color Coalition. Today, we'll be discussing the future of pay equity in Massachusetts and beyond. We're gonna run through our quick little agenda here. I'm gonna finish up our welcome and then we'll hear some special remarks from our treasurer Goldberg. And then we'll hop right into the conversation um, after our introductions and then wrap up right around 12. Quick thank you real quick to our Massachusetts Women of Color uh, Coalition and our Massachusetts Commission on the Status of Women. You can find their Instagrams at the handles listed on your screen. And my superstar colleague, Sarah, will be dropping a bunch of links for you. So if you are looking for more information on any of our partners or the organizations that are represented today, please check out our chat and we'll make sure that we get those links out to you in the follow-up email. You can always join our conversation on Twitter using the hashtag EqualPayMA. You can follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Um, and for more information, you can always visit our EqualPayMA.com website or email us at the email on your screen. And without further ado, I would love to introduce our Massachusetts State Treasurer and Receiver General, Deborah Goldberg. Oh. I recognize that, so I kind of knew it was my turn to talk. Um, thank you, Shaitia, and good morning to everyone today. Um, I'm thrilled, but not thrilled. I'm thrilled to be here as we conclude and look back on our 2021 Equal Pay MA roundtables, but yet I'm not thrilled that we still have to have this conversation. And in fact, that it's even more critical today after what's gone on in the last couple of years. We've seen that women, and especially women of color across Massachusetts, have faced incredibly challenging circumstances throughout the pandemic and the economic downturn that it has caused. Um, we started to see this early on, and I even remember a moment where Elena Van Tassel, our executive director of the Office of Economic Empowerment, and one of my deputy treasurers texted me one day and said, we're going so far backwards that I don't know how we're gonna get work our way forward. And that's what these round tables and our work together with the fabulous women I have with me here today, that we're trying to accelerate, get back to where we were and move forward. So early in 2021, we created the round table series to examine and understand exactly how this pandemic has affected women, people of color, color, and other marginalized groups. These discussions truly have been instrumental in helping identify the strategies and policies we need to rebuild a more inclusive economy moving forward. So over the next few weeks and months, my team will review, summarize, and then share all the incredible insights our panelists have given us throughout the year and today. But one thing that's really stood out for me is the critical importance of us hanging together, camaraderie, and then mentorship. Mentorship has always been important, but it's even more important today. So I've loved hearing the words of advice for younger women and people of color to join coalitions, advocacy groups, and find allies and by the way, sometimes these allies are men because there are a lot of men who understand this and they in many ways can help us along. We will best address these inequalities by continuing to team up with people and organizations that want to achieve our shared goals. And we also have to keep the pressure on them. So throughout the year, we had gathered leading women and people of color who have shared their crucial perspectives on a huge range of topics. We've connected constituents through the state with community leaders, elected officials, and government organizations that can help. I want to give a special shout out um, for those who didn't hear me when I jumped on. 
Shaitia Sproul in our Office of Economic Empowerment and the team who has worked with her have put together an incredible series. Shaitia, you deserve a shout out. So Thank you, I'm, Treasurer. So I'm thrilled we have one more opportunity today to cover pay equity, wage equality, whatever term you want to use, but that's what it is, and discuss where we go from here with these four fabulous women. While we still have a long way to go on achieving equal pay for people of all genders and races, because I'm going to tell you from the very beginning, we identified men of color who were not getting equal pay and we've pushed that agenda along too. We should celebrate the progress we have made in being able to advocate together. There's nothing like coalitions and advocate for policies and employer practices that bring us closer. So please stay connected to us to find out first about our 2022 programming on equal pay in Massachusetts and now I want to thank you for joining us and pass it back to Shaitia. Thank you, Treasurer. I'm going to bring back my slides. So I want to introduce the rest of our panel. This is a great team, everybody. Stay tuned. So excited. <laughs> we have some phenomenal women here today. The first one I'm going to introduce is our Massachusetts Commission on the Status of Women Chairwoman, Danella Clark. She is also the president and CEO of Boston Arts Academy Foundation. Next, we have Massachusetts Women of Color Coalition CEO and President Celia J. Blue, who is also the interim director of the Rhode Island Department of Human Services. Next, we have the Department of Labor Women's Bureau Director, Wendy Chun Hoon. She's the 20th director of the Women's Bureau and was appointed by President Biden in February this year. And finally, we have MassNow Executive Director, Sasha Goodfriend, and she is also chair of the Massachusetts Commission on LGBTQ Youth. Welcome, ladies. I'm gonna start adding you all to the screen as I'm talking here. As I said, all amazing women. We are thrilled to have you. So thank you for your time. And let's get into the questions. So the first question I have is for Chairwoman Clark. The Massachusetts Equal Pay Act was passed in 2016. And being that the commission was a founder of one of the co-founders of Equal Pay Coalition along with MassNow, that, that got this legislation passed. Can you tell us a little bit about the law and why it's so important? And then if you could tell us a little bit about if Massachusetts has made any progress in the last three years towards closing that wage gap. Well, the law, thank you, Shaitia. And uh, good morning, Madam Treasurer. It was great to be with you, as you said, a couple of weeks ago. Good to see you, Sasha, Wendy, uh, and Celia. It's always great to be in a Zoom room. Um, with phenomenal women leaders. Um, the law, Shaitia, is critical. As we all know, I was there when Governor Baker signed on August 1st, 2016. The law went into effect July 1st, 2018. And here we stand uh, three years later. And in fact, because of the pandemic, we've actually lost uh, some ground. We all know that many women uh, have been forced out of the workforce. We are truly experiencing a she session. And while in our capital city here in the Commonwealth, Boston, we just um, received the most uh, recent uh, report that really shows that while white women and Asian women have moved the needle somewhat, they are both now 70 and 71 cents on the dollar relative to white men. I remain deeply concerned about the fact that black and Latino women have actually lost some ground during these past three years. They are 55 and 51 cents. And I'm not saying this, uh, Jerice, if you could put in the chat, uh, where the data came from, the Boston Wage uh, Project. I'm just deeply concerned. And I will tell you all that this past uh, Tuesday, I believe it was, I was invited to a session 
uh, with our new mayor, uh, Mayor Michelle Wu, where she talked about uh, she wanted to know as women leaders what we thought uh, she should focus on. And clearly one of the issues is pay equity. I was happy as a woman of color to learn that black men and Latino men have actually done better in the state. Cause for me, it's not just about gender. It's also about uh, race, but I'm really concerned and I'm excited for this conversation to see where do we go from here? How do we make sure that we actually get to that dollar, but also how do we make sure that specifically black and Latina women really get uh, caught up? I was a little, I was in the conversation on Tuesday and we had a diversity of women. Uh, Celia, Sasha, you were there. And one of the things that just really, um, Tanisha Sullivan, the president of the Boston branch of NAACP, she said, Danella, fix your face, you know, in the text, meaning that I love my sister telling me to fix my crown. Because one of the things that's so frustrating um, to me, Madam Treasurer, is when white women who held leadership positions, and there were a few on that Zoom, don't do anything to really lift as they climb. But now today they're saying, oh, we have to center women of color and blah, 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 blah. It's not about, um, I, I will end with this. There's a famous uh, black author, James Baldwin. And he often says, I can't believe what you say because I see what you do. Now I could believe what our great treasurer, Deb. Goldberg says, because I see it in how she's amplified and elevated people like Shaitia um, and others. So there's a lot of work to be done, Shaitia, three years later since the law has been impacted, but it's important, but a lot of work to be done. Thank you. I want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, well said. Um, my next question is for Wendy. Where are women most concentrated in the workforce and how do those industries play a role in the larger conversation about pay equity and supporting women in the workplace? Yeah. Um, first, incredible, incredible to be here with you all today and the work that you're doing in Massachusetts to really tackle these issues, um, which have been stubborn and long held. Um, and just, um, just wanna thank you, um, Chairwoman Clark and also uh, Treasurer Goldberg um, for really leading in this space. Um, and I'm excited to hear from, from our other uh, colleagues here today. Um, I would start by saying that the Women's Bureau, um, just to make sure everybody knows uh, what we can do in, in support of your work, um, is, is really the only federal, uh, congressionally mandated uh, federal agency to work um, on women's issues and represent the interests of wage earning women in the public policy process. So please know about us. And what I would also say is that we're a hundred year old agency. One of our superpowers is really data analysis. So um, last year, the Women's Bureau um, was working on a really um, comprehensive uh, study with the Census Bureau that outlined uh, you know, what the pay gaps are across some 350 occupations. And I say that now because I wanna um, remember, remind myself to pop in the chat for everybody, this very cool widget, it's like an interactive widget. You can look across all 350 of these occupations and really see um, you know, what women's uh, earnings are in comparison to men's. So, um, so I, I will remember to do that. Um, and I think you know what, we always think about at the front is the just outright discrimination when it comes to pay um, and, and you know, everything we need to do to address that. What I wanted to raise uh, in this conversation is really sort of stepping back and also seeing what has been long contributing to the gender and racial wage gap because it's manifold, right? And these are the levers that we have to be addressing. Um, you know, the fact that, um, and this is also uh, evident in some of that research that I mentioned, you know, two women are still locked out, I would say, of really better paying, higher paying jobs in the economy. You know, women are small percentages of carpenters and plumbers and, and uh, uh, good jobs in the trades. And, um, and I, I think we have a real opportunity to address that right now. Women are totally concentrated um, and, and a lot of women of color concentrated in the most lowest paid, poor paid, uh, most some of the most important jobs in our economy, jobs that stand up the rest of the economy, like all the care jobs, 
Um, and so, you know, we have to address uh, raising both wages in the in these underpaid jobs, undervalued jobs, because of long held structural racism and sexism in our country. Um, and we have to increase the number of women who are in some of these higher paying jobs. Um, and then finally, you know, contributing to the gender racial wage gap is the fact that we have not had the kind of care infrastructure that we all know that we need. Uh, women are largely, you know, the caregivers in their families and their communities and doing all of that unpaid often means, um, and of course you will prioritize your family. It means that, you know, you're taking time out of work to do that. You're stalling your career in some places critical in your life um, and not earning. Um, and especially, you know, really thinking through, um, and Massachusetts is, you know, a state that's leading on this work, thinking through, um, you know, paid family medical leave, paid sick and safe days, uh, child, comprehensive child care, elder care, disability care. So really building out that care infrastructure to address um, how caregiving penalties are, are real for all of us. Um, so I, I would just offer that framework um, and, and really want to say, you know, as Congress is moving these very large, as the administration is putting big markers out there um, on jobs and built infrastructure um, and having that passed and now starting to see how that money is gonna make its way from the federal governments down into the states, including Massachusetts um, for building bro roads, bridges, fixing homes, fixing lead pipes um, and really thinking about how are women and people of color getting into those jobs. Uh, the, the Women's Bureau has a grants program that we love to elevate and want um, to make sure that everybody knows about called Women in Apprenticeships and Non-Traditional Occupations. Um, and again, there's work in Massachusetts that, you know, is just leading on this issue of getting women into these non-traditional occupations. So, uh, so really focusing on that as the money starts to move through down to states. And as we contemplate and hopefully see this Build Back Better package uh, come across the finish line. Um, it's important investments in the care infrastructure, right? In those childcare, home care uh, jobs and making sure that those jobs uh, will be better paid. So looking forward to all of that and, and really um, in partnership with all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, you know, that federal lens and kind of bringing it back down to what it means for us at the state. Um, my next question is for Celia. Um, we know that the female labor force participation rapidly declined during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and mothers were disproportionately burdened with childcare responsibilities, which unfortunately, we know, led to a lot of women's fall, fall, mothers falling out of the workforce. What efforts have you seen in your work specifically and throughout the region um, of folks supporting working mothers? Thank you, and thanks for the introduction earlier, and it's good to be here with all these fabulous women. Um, so uh, for, for me right now, they're in the state of Rhode Island and regionally, and actually nationally, there's a real focus right now on tackling the crisis that exists for child the childcare industry. Um, we, you know, if you talk to advocates, they would say that this was a problem before COVID. It was a crisis before COVID. And like what COVID has done for many inequities is really shine that light in this area. And speaking about the impact for women and women of color, this is an industry that's primarily concentrated by women and women of color. So not only on one hand, you have, you know, mothers trying to find childcare, access to childcare, quality childcare. We have the pandemic just doing a lot of different things from the industry perspective. Keeping the lights on, keeping your doors open as a provider, or, and then we see an impact in the family um, provider areas um, where there you're seeing closures and then you can't hire enough staff because the wages are so low. They're like averaging $12 an hour for this important workforce. Um, and so there's just, and talk about systemic and from a systemic perspective, we have to start really, we, we have no choice now, right? We're, we're tackling this. So some of the work um, that we're doing now 
you know, and, and as I said earlier, it matters because mothers are having a hard time finding, and so they're dropping out of the workforce. Some of the work that we're doing now regionally and nationally is really looking at how we can in multiple ways, right, while we're tackling the longer term issues that we need to tackle, which will take a little time, but we've got to tackle them. So right now we're essentially trying to stop the bleeding is how we look at it. We have, we are supporting providers through grant funding um, to, so they can keep their lights on working with them. We're support assisting families by waiving the co-pays. I know in Rhode Island, that's what we've been doing. We've waived co-pays uh, for families um, that are eligible. We also got a legislative win earlier in the year um, where we're going to be capping co-pays at 7% starting in January um, based on your family's income. Some will say that hasn't gone far enough, but that's certainly heading in the right direction. And then helping to retain and attract workforce in this area. Um, so right now, for example, you know, Governor McKee has put forward a supplemental budget for about $13 million that we've been advocating for, where 12.7 of that money would go directly to the workforce and bonuses. We're also incent as we give grants out to our providers, we are incentivizing them to try to use some of that money as well towards their workforce, with some of our data that we're getting in are showing that they're doing that. Uh, but these are just really hard jobs, especially right now as we're all dealing with so many different issues with COVID. Um, and then we have to tackle it in a systemic way around the rates that we pay our child care providers, which which will take some, you know, some really good, I think, methodical thinking. There's some of the, the things that we're doing now around looking at the rates and then ultimately shoring up um, the um, the uh, pay uh, for these uh, providers. So all of these things are, are sort of what we're doing. We're seeing other states across the country that are also doing the same kind of thing right now we, in terms of um, doing putting those investments out now while we look at tackling um, the infrastructure for childcare. And it's incredibly important because you know, our economy as a whole rule, uh, relies on childcare to allow parents to go to work and to ensure the next generation, which is also a big part of this, right? We know about early learning and how important that is for our little ones, is prepared for success and investments in early learning translate into investment across the workforce and overall the economy. So I like to say, we've got to shore up the workforce while we're handling all these different things, we've got to shore up the workforce behind the workforce to allow us then, especially as women, to be able to you know, go to work, be back in the economy and start really again as Danella was saying earlier and Wendy that we're seeing that we are going backwards and we need to start going forward so that's um what my comments are for you today thank you thank you and shifting over to my friend Sasha um throughout this series and you know we've done a ton of these roundtables, but we've heard a lot about different legislation at the state level, including the parity on boards legislation that's increasing uh, racial and gender parity on boards and commissions, the Common Start Bill, which would um, provide universal child care, access to child care, quality education, um, and the Wage Transparency Bill, which is a few of them. <laughs> but what are some other bills and how can they help advance women's security what are or address those challenges that women see especially now thank you shatia um hello everyone it's so good to be here i am so honored to be with this incredible panel of um, feminists in service i also have to give a shout out to the mass now members i see watching hello um, it's really exciting to be in this equal pay conversation also because I feel like I learned how to do what I do as a feminist activist through um, participating in the Equal Pay Coalition. So I also want to give a shout out to Jill Ashton, who I see in the um, attendees and, you know, all the women and mentors who have um, I've been learning from. What was really exciting about working on the pay equity bill, I think, in that is ex we need to keep in mind as we think about all of the bills that we need to pass in Massachusetts in order to build a feminist democracy is that um, people said that the pay equity bill wasn't going to pass. 
because it was a first time file. And yet it did in one legislative session because we had stakeholders like all of the organizations here who were able to come together, including the private sector to show that when you do support women, you're supporting families and you're supporting the whole Commonwealth. And when you do share salary information, it does help uh, workers and it does help the workforce produce better work. And so we know that passing this legislation is possible here in Massachusetts and that when we pass this legislation, other states around the country are looking to Massachusetts and have been able to adapt this legislation as well. Um, unfortunately, like we've been hearing, there are still a lot more barriers towards achieving a feminist democracy and equal pay and economic equality across gender and race and, so, and all sorts of different intersectional lines in Massachusetts. And there is not one bill that is going to answer that um, call. We do need universal childcare. Um, we need to have campaign funds that can use childcare because I want to say first and foremost, childcare is the single biggest barrier towards gender equity in the workplace. Um, but some of the things that MassNow has done since the passing of the Equal Pay Bill that um, also is not a new issue, but was new for us to be talking about is seeing period poverty. Um, period poverty is the inability to pay for menstrual products. And um, we know that period poverty exists in Massachusetts because we know that approximately one out of seven children in Massachusetts is living in poverty. And so if you're struggling to pay for um, food, if you're struggling to pay for rent, then we know that you're struggling to pay for menstrual products too because menstrual products are not free and they are essential items, as I'm sure all of you menstruators in the audience know it happens every month, whether a pandemic is happening or not, and they're not in the bathrooms. You have to pay for them. And so um, the, we have been working with lead sponsors to introduce the I am bill. I am an unapologetic menstruator. And also I am so as an acronym for increasing access to menstrual products and would make them free in all schools, all prisons, and all shelters in Massachusetts. Um, period products are some of the least donated items in shelters. And we have been calling shelters across the state to ask them if they have menstrual products. And there have been activists on the ground who have been doing menstrual product donation drives and giving products to shelters. But we know that everyone who is in a shelter or not in a shelter and is unhoused in Massachusetts and is menstruating needs access to menstrual products. And I believe, and MassNow members believe that the state can and should be responsible for meeting this need. Um, also in prisons and jails, it is not known by most officers or most incarcerated people that menstrual products are, should be given for free. And so if there isn't a policy to ensure that there is access, then that is not true access and people will go to the commissary. I was just talking to Stacy Borden from New Beginnings Reentry Services, who was telling us that menstrual product packs for a pack of eight are $12. Just think about how much that adds up after every cycle. Just think about if you have a heavy flow, um, you know, how much money more products you need and think about the stigma that I'm sure you're already feeling. Maybe you're getting a little red because there has been so much stigma and taboo about something that is essential to our bodies. And so um, if you wanna learn more about the I am bill, you can go to MassNow's website and you can also join the Massachusetts Menstrual Equity Coalition, which is working to contact legislators um, because we believe that by addressing period poverty, we will address both economic inequity, we will address health inequities um, and help move the needle on pay equity in Massachusetts too. Thank you, Sasha, for sharing and highlighting that. I think it's important to um, talk about how all of these different levels of our lives kind of come together and really, really impact our financial and economic success. So please check out those websites as we drop them in the chat, Wendy's website, Celia's website, all of our websites. Um, 
So now I'm gonna switch over and ask our treasurer Goldberg. Um, if an employer asked you what they can do to ensure equal pay and equal opportunity for their employees, what would you tell them? So I always start off with, have you done an internal audit? There are actually auditing firms that can go through an entire organization to identify internal wage inequity and who who it is and where it is and show them how it exists. Um, and I would also tell them to go to our Equal Pay MA website. And uh, there's a lot of resources there where you can first of all learn the state of the wage gap in Massachusetts. Because I, by the way, I do hear from people that say, I don't think I have one, how would I know? And that's why I encourage the audit. Um, but they will find resources there on the state of the wage gap, um, how it can depend on a person's race, and why eliminating it is good for the business, not just the employee, but the business. Um, our website also has an employer toolkit. And for those women who are interested in their gap and what it has done to them, um, there's actually a wage calculator and they can send an anonymous um, uh, email to their employer. Uh, this, um, these resources like the employer toolkit will give any employer detailed steps on how they can promote equal pay within their offices. And um, lastly, we did roundtables on this. I think it was all the way back in 2017, bringing in a lot of employers. And that study is available. Um, I would ask that Elena or someone from OEE just put it in the chat box, the link to it, because it's actually quite interesting and it's employers sharing with each other ways in which um, how they, they have done or look to do in reducing wage inequity. But those are the strategies. And then to set up um, fair and transparent um, uh, yearly evaluations of employees and how raises are given and or not given for that matter. So I hope that helps a little bit. Yes, thank you, Jenner. And I have another one for you. Oh. Um, and I think you, uh, you alluded to it a little bit, but what are some other programs that you offer that women can take advantage of right now to earn the salary and financial security they deserve? So from the very beginning, um, we and we did an internal audit at the very beginning, internally at Treasury. So I believe in starting at home, which we have done um, going back to 2015 onward. And then we, um, we've had our women's empowerment series that we've um, had several all over the state. Obviously, COVID interfered with that. Um, in terms of in-person, but our salary negotiation workshops are really critical. We have partnered with the American Association of University Women, and now we have free online salary negotiation workshops. You can access those by visiting our Equal Pay MA website. They take less than two hours and provide you with the skills and tools to advocate for the pay and compensation you deserve. We also believe, and we do this on the um, business side, that HR directors are really critical, um, that HR directors need the training to identify their own internal unconscious biases and to rectify many things when they are in um, the interviewing process. But by arming women with the tools to negotiate um, is critically important. And I wanna make it clear, there are cultural barriers for women and women of color, so it's but all women in total, to feeling comfortable asking for what they're worth. We've seen it and we've, we've turned it on our heads, even in people applying for us under asking for what they're worth. Um, I also want to encourage people to look at our worth and wealth seminars. In early 2022, we are launching them and it will provide Massachusetts women with financial skills and knowledge to be more confident in their economic future. Um, participants will be able to attend five weekly 
webinars and will receive training on topics such as salary negotiation, accessing higher education, understanding worker rights, balancing relationships and money, and so much more. But these are all things that impact women. And then I want to let you know that from the very beginning, I totally recognize the barriers for women in the financial services fields, and those are pretty broad, and those are phenomenally well-paying fields, and even the most qualified, highly educated, experienced women hit those ceilings. And so what we have done is we've been hosting a Women in Finance Fellowship annually in the summer for undergraduate women in Massachusetts, and we not just put them in financial jobs all over our, the treasurer's office, and we've got around 13, give or take, departments. And uh, so there's a lot of interesting different opportunities, but we mentor them and we introduce them to women outside of the treasurer's office to develop networking and mentoring possibilities. So if you're listening today and you're in school and you're interested in a career in finance, keep your eyes open for the 2023 applications for next year um, because it is competitive, but it is great. And I always um, look forward to being able to mentor um, the women in our program. Thank you, Jen. And like I said, we've been dropping a bunch of links in the chat. Um, and if you've registered, we'll make sure that, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll make sure that you guys get the, um, these links in the follow-up email. So if you haven't registered, it's still open, so register. Um, I have a couple other questions and this is gonna be directed to my entire panel here. So feel free to hop in wherever you feel comfortable. Um, but what, role can state governments play to ensure equity in pay and access to higher paying opportunities for women? Well, I know that there um, is important legislation uh, now around wage transparency. I know Andrea Silbert and so many others are leading on this work. I think it's really important the reason Boston was able to get the data was because some of our larger employers, partners, Vertex, et cetera, participated. But we need to ensure that everybody, it's, it's really unfortunate. I did a talk recently with Bob Rivers, who's the CEO of Eastern Bank. And he said, you know, it's a shame we even have to have a law on pay equity, but we do because we have to hold people accountable. But I think what the state can do is ensure that all of our employers actually have wage uh, transparency. I heard this, Madam Treasurer, um, from um, Rep. Pat Haddad. She said that women and people of color tend to be head down. We tend to be workhorses and the men tend to be show horses. So the men can be show horses, be slick, and they come in and they get their dollar. But we come in and we're just happy to get a job. We're just happy to stay at that job for 10 years, keep our heads down, be the workhorses, get the work done. So we, and again, there will be some HR people, as the treasurer said, who are really key to this, who if, you know, Sally comes in and says, you know what, I'm just happy to be a workhorse and I'm happy to take 60 cents and just to be able to feed my children, they won't do the right thing. So we really need to focus on these wage transparency bills. Again, I know Jarice uh, is on here. I'm not sure if my uh, former sister uh, chairwoman Nina Kimball is on, but Jarice, if you could drop those bill numbers in the chat, I definitely think that moving that legislation forward and having transparency in wages will be helpful towards pay equity. Well said, Dan Danella. Um, in terms of the, I think, enforcement as well, right? I think having more efforts around enforcement of the bills and the laws that we already have um, around employ with employers, I think is really important. And I, I think, um, from a national and state level in terms of you know task force maybe that could be set up that are specifically focused on this and we are sharing information from a national level and a state level i know there was some effort to collect additional data on the e 
is it the EEO-1 form, EEO-1 form, um, under the former uh, um, President Obama's administration. I think those were some efforts that were turned around and perhaps, you know, looking at that from a national and a state perspective where we could add those additional data points that's not currently being collected back to transparency. Um, I think it's something that could ease it, well, I say easily, these things usually take a little bit of time, but should be a conscientious effort where not only we look at this, focus on this from a task force perspective, from a state perspective, but also um, from, a, from a national level and really making sure we're holding our employers accountable uh, to enforce the current laws that we have on the books as well. Yes, Wendy. Thanks, yeah. I. I appreciate both of those remarks. Um, you know, having worked at the state level for many years um, and, and really on some of the incredible advocacy campaigns that you all have talked about, I, I would say, you know, keep, keep that going, keep pushing the needle. It's incredibly effective when states are able to sort of set that bench, <laughs> that benchmark, um, and then challenge each other to keep raising the bar because all of that lays the path for federal reform. So it's a really effective strategy that, that Massachusetts is already leading on. And you know, one of the um, incredible campaigns is this childcare campaign that you have uh, active right now. Um, in addition to some of the, uh, the things that you were um, sharing about the, the advancements in, in even further equal pay uh, legislation, but, um, but really thinking about in this moment, um, what are the conditions that states can create to, you know, anticipate hopefully some federal investment um, in states to really bring a more equitable childcare uh, system? So thinking about the fact that, you know, the providers themselves are, are oftentimes small business owner women, women of color, um, as sort of one plank, uh, the obvious plank about making sure that um, families, working families, have more accessible, affordable care. Um, and, and the third plank really is about uh, the thing that we've been talking about, raising wages. So holding those three together, you know, as a, as a triangle and, and sort of a, um, a framework for how to get to equity, greater equity in childcare. Um, so I think that's really important and you're right there. You're having these conversations really holistically in Massachusetts. The other thing that was on my mind um, from what I had shared earlier about uh, women in more non-traditional occupations and treasure, you said this, like how incredibly hard it is, whether it's in the trades or in the financial industry, um, cybersecurity, IT, STEM, you know, the fields that are still, and when we say non-traditional, they're still less than 25% women and, and in that workforce and often way fewer, like 3%, 4%. Um, and the incredible work that, you know, the, the amount of work that we need to do to address harassment and bullying so that it's not just about, you know, women sort of getting in the front end of that pipeline, but women and people of color being able to stay and, and, and succeed in those jobs that, you know, that, that are the good paying jobs. Um, and, and just thinking about, um, I was speaking yesterday with an international community about gender-based violence in the workplace um, and the impact that that has and who is really at the center of that women, people of color, um, women of color. Uh, so just thinking about those intersections about how um, we need to do more on domestic violence, on gender-based violence, um, whether it's harassment and bullying in a workplace or you know, domestic violence um, at home that also makes its way into the workplace and just how to think through, you know, economic security, economic justice um, for people who are, who are um, sort of uh, impacted from all sides. Um, I'll just add, oh yeah, go for it. I just want to quickly mention, um, since you brought up um, tech and, te and, and the like, I've been in very involved lately and have been actually interviewed by the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal because I've taken a position nationally against a company called Activision Blizzard, which is a um, they're best known for having developed the video game Call to Duty, um, not something that I've ever played. However, um, since July, there have been employee uh, walkouts and California has filed a lawsuit against them for harassment and bullying of the women 
um, in this organization and that um, the board and the CEO have refused to address it to the degree that they actually have something that the guys hang out in and called the Cosby suite. And so this is not theoretical. This is going on in the areas of growth where there's enormous wealth to be attained, where the harassment and bullying besides the barriers to entry are real. And so um, this shows you how I've transferred some of our thinking and initiatives nationally. That is such a um, explicit example, Treasure, of how sexual harassment in the workplace is entirely a barrier towards pay equity. Why are women putting our head down and just trying to get through our day at work? Because there's a pattern of sexual harassment in many workplaces, not because it starts at work. Rape culture, of course, is something that we're all taught through the media. And that is why state government needs to pass legislation to teach comprehensive sex education that includes consent. Because imagine a Commonwealth where the 1 million students who are in school today learn consent now and how that can change the culture of the workplace, workplace um, instead of retroactively adding non-discrimination trainings in the workplace also. But there's also a number of bills, um, the Protected at Work Act, the Dignity at Work Act that are um, before the legislature right now in order to combat sexual harassment and um, abuse in the workplace and not even in the workplace for employees who might be experiencing it from out of the workplace, but making sure that they are protected at work too. Um, so that, that is definitely top of mind to say. And then the last thing I'll just say is data collection. You know, so many times I've heard period poverty doesn't exist. We don't have students missing school because they don't have access to menstrual products. We don't have people who are incarcerated who need access. Well, you don't know that because you haven't asked the question. <laughs> but if you ask the question on the Youth First Behavior Survey, um, if you ask that question and make it a policy, then we can see this problem that has already been there. Um, even though we know from our voices and our truths already that this is real, state government can play the role of collecting data um, just like with childcare, you know, I've heard that we don't know as a state where our four-year-olds are because we're not collecting data on it. How can we meet the need of supplying universal childcare if we don't have the infrastructure to collect the data? Um, and so I look forward to continuing to work on all of those things with all these amazing women here too. Thank you all. The next question I have is what is one thing viewers can do today to help close the wage gap and increase economic security for everyone, Massachusetts and nationally? What are some things that we can do like right now? I can jump in and say, talk about it. Talk about it at dinner, talk about it on your day, talk about it at work. How do you know if you're not getting paid as much as your coworkers? You don't until you ask. And thanks to this pay equity law, you're able to ask without being retaliated. Before this law was an act was passed and then came into effect in 2018, you could be fired for sharing what your salary was. And so I know it's uncomfortable um, because we've been taught that it's not something we're supposed to talk about, but this is one more person giving you permission to talk about it with your coworkers. And I know that there's um, the salary negotiations here that can also help uh, give you tools and sentences to use to keep in your back pocket to support those conversations too. And I just, I'll jump in next. Um, I, I think being educated about your industry. There's so much, so many tools out there today that you could easily find out what is your industry? What's the average pay? What's, what's the range? Arm yourself with going into any job or even if you're already in the job um, and didn't necessarily do the homework before accepting the role that you could go back and make a case for why you should be paid the same as your counterpart. 
and be bold about it. And I know some of the work that we are doing at uh, Maywalk, as we finally call ourselves, is really helping to educate and inform and build a series. And I look forward um, to doing more collaboration with this team here on how we could put even those series and workshops um, together to continue to enforce and empower, well not enforce, empower um, each other um, to really do what we need to, we need to do um, with being educated, being armed, and having the courage uh, to have those conversations. I would say allies. And I really include, again, I just cannot celebrate and applaud our treasurer, Deb Goldberg, enough, because she doesn't just talk the talk, she walks the walk, not just here in the Commonwealth, but what she is doing nationally and what she does with her own staff. And I'm, I, I just say allies and white women allies, because they're ahead of us. Uh, my daughter is, is a young lawyer. She's been teaching me about white adjacent, Celia Blue, and she says Asian women, white adjacent, it must be a law book somewhere that, that she has that. We've got to be about making sure we all rise together. We have to have more treasurer Deb Goldbergs. It can't just be talking about it. It has to be doing it. It has to be that the women that are ahead reach back and get the Black and Latina um, women up and that we all work together. It can't just be about talking about it. We have to have more Deb Goldbergs, not just in state government, but in the private sector, the nonprofit sector, the higher ed um, sector. I just get so frustrated, even when I see women leaders, you look around, the, the white women are moving ahead and they're not, they're, they come and they sit and they say, let's center but we really have to be about doing the work wherever our perch is. I am so proud that as the first black chairwoman of the commission, that I ensured diversity on our staff, that I've gone to our appointing authorities and ensured diversity amongst our commissioners, that we're making sure in every aspect of our lives, so every woman on this um, Zoom that holds a leadership position, I would encourage you to aspire to be like Deb Goldberg and truly lift as you climb so that when your work is done, you could look back at the record and your resume and say, I truly made a difference. I wasn't just talking about it. I could point to that I actually did it. Thank you. That just that directly connects to us. I saw in the chat, you know, there's someone said something to the effect of there's not a lot of people in HR or in management that do that are in the space to do salary negotiation that go to bat for these women who are asking for their salary negotiation or promotion. So that's an opportunity for women in those roles to, you know to advocate for their sisters and bring those sisters forward with them. Absolutely. So I, I really, Be really clear, Shaitia, we also need male allies. You know, some yes. came out, he's my appointing uh, authority. I, I love him to pieces. Uh, the meeting that I was in, Madam Treasurer, with Michelle Wu the other night, I talked about also the importance of what's pushing us out of the workplace is mental uh, health challenges that we as women are facing and domestic violence. And again, Jarice, you could share in the chat, this just came out, our dear governor was speaking somewhere this morning and became emotional about domestic violence. So we also need male allies. So if you are in a company where you're not in an HR position or you're not in a management position, find your way to the C-suite, whoever the CEO is or whomever and say, can I have 15 minutes with you? Can I talk to you? Use your voice to what Sasha said, but don't just use your voice, use it with the people that can really make a difference and that can have impact uh, and change. I love what Sasha said use your voice. If you're not in management, you're not in HR, find your way to the corner office and, um, and get the results that we need. And as we talk about allies, you know, and sponsors, right, is, is to, to find that sponsor to help you with 
um, navigating and empowering you to, to raise your voice. Um, that is that is also really important. I just want to jump in because there was a question or a comment from um, Tanisha about um, about going beyond having a space where it's not just white women um, doing this work. And one of the things, Tanisha, I want you to know is that um, if not everyone in my HR department, but certainly 98% of those in my HR department are women of color and they train the other HR directors, some of whom are women of color in the other agencies within the treasurer's office. That is why my transition team of 35 people were representative by a long shot of all, um, all groups and all, uh, all um, every people from the LGBTQ community, um, different races, uh, genders, you name it, because we wanted to make sure we attracted a workforce that was representative of everyone in this state and who could put forward my agenda. I actually ran on this agenda. And it was because I believe so deeply in this. We, by a long shot, have the most diverse office in state government. And that includes that I have um, quite a, a large union contingency in one of our agencies where um, people have long, their average age is 55. So changing the dynamic there has been a greater challenge, but we have done so. And so that's what I believe people are talking about on this panel when they say have allies that believe in the mission that can help then immediately open the doors and bring everyone in. And so um, I wanted to clarify so that you know that progress is being made and that strategies are being implemented and shared on how we can accelerate these changes for everyone. This is amazing. It's hard to see this conversation come to a close. I would just offer quickly, um, there is a lot of money that is moving right now to states. States have so much decision-making power. The leadership that you have uh, in, in this state to really foreground racial and gender justice at this point um, and to see that money spent well towards these, towards these outcomes, better outcomes for women, women of color, people of color. Um, folks who have been marginalized in many ways. So power is at in your hands. Look forward to see what, what you do with it. I did, I did it. I almost made it through the whole thing without <laughs> the mute thing. So um, I was trying to say, that's a great note to end. I can't believe we have to end. I'm sure we could talk for a couple more hours without all this, but I wanted to thank all my panelists for your time and your conversation today. Thank you to everyone who joined us to whether it's Facebook or Zoom or maybe later watching this on YouTube. Thank you all for your time. And we will be sending out links and resources in that follow-up email. You have a few more seconds to register if you haven't already. We will be back in 2022 with another series. So stay tuned and please check out that Worth and Wealth seminars, our equalpay.com website. And if anything, Equal Pay MA. Don't forget the MA. EqualPayMA.com is the website. Again, we'll be sending out all of those links. And if you follow us on OEE's Facebook, Twitter, now LinkedIn, we will be sharing all of this information. So thank you again, all of you, for joining. Happy thank, you, thank you. We are so <laughs> proud of your yeah. leadership. Yes, we want to end where the treasurer started. I am just so <laughs> incredibly proud of you and so grateful that our treasurer has allowed you to lead and to walk in your power. You are not allowed. I'm lucky right to have her. Yes, <laughs> we're <laughs> lucky to have lucky her. To have her. Yeah. Thank you and so we, much. And we're all that. lucky to have her in our circles <laughs> with us too. So we are so, I echo Dan Danella's sentiment and great job to you, Shaiti, and your team you. and, and for your leadership, oh. a treasurer, and looking forward uh, to working together um, even more. So take care Thank and happy you. holidays. Happy, Happy holidays. holidays. See you healthy. All soon. Stay healthy. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Bye now.